Hello and welcome. I'm Tim Weiss, Professor of Conducting at the Oberlin Conservatory and Director of Oberlin's Sinfonietta. And in today's presentation, I am joined by composer Kati Agosh as we discuss her artistic work and specifically her piece, Vessel, in advance of a performance given by the Sinfonietta in Oberlin's Warner Concert Hall on March 6th. I'm so glad you've tuned in. Let's get right to it. Welcome, Kati. We are so pleased to have this opportunity. Thank you, Tim. It's great to be here. So Vessel was composed for the Metropolis Ensemble through a commission from Meet the Composer in 2011. And the instrumentation of three singers, violin, bass, piano, harp, and three percussion was dictated by the conditions of the commission. You have three singers, each singing their own text, one in Hebrew, one in English, and one in Latin. I'm curious, why did you choose these three texts and uh, what do they mean for you? Well, let's imagine that, that one is in love with somebody from another culture and one is, one is trying to learn to speak their language so as to, as to forge a sort of rapprochement. So, the English text is a fulcrum, English is my mother tongue, and that's the Cummings poem. And then over that, I layer a Hebrew poem um, by Yehuda Halevi um, called Let My Beloved Come Into His Garden. It's a very rhapsodic text that the high soprano sings. And then under that, I layer a fragment from Catullus in Latin. And the, I chose these texts because they're all representations in different ways of the idea of a vessel. So the middle text, um, the Cummings, the poet becomes a physical vessel. The poem says, I carry your heart, I carry it in my heart. And the Halavi text over top, um, the text is a vessel, a vessel itself. So that, and that culminates in a so song of songs, a song of songs quote, um, which we'll get to later. And the Latin is actually about a sea, a sea vessel. So the poem speaks of, the speed and reliability of a, of a boat. Um, so they're all, they, they all show different sides of the idea of the vessel, just, just as the text shows different sides of a, of a lover addressing her beloved. And the vessel is a metaphor for love. Yeah, I'm not sure how I, how I came up with the idea of a vessel. I mean, it's just such a beautiful, a, such a beautiful image in a way. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how I ultimately arrived at that, but I love the idea of the piece being a vessel as well. And of course, the, the sound world is very delicate and, and rarefied and exotic. And it, it ends with these prayer bowls, which don't have definite tunings. They're they're in um, inexact tunings, and those are vessels themselves as well. So we end with the, this oh, right. striking vessels, which resonate. Yes, I actually hadn't thought of that metaphor, but the the prayer bowls are vessels in and of themselves. So they have this other layer of metaphor to them. Right, and that's one of the distinct um, the distinct sounds in the piece, I think. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. The texts do complement one another, uh, and this metaphor of a vessel either bringing back love or uh, being strong enough to carry oneself on the strength of its love, it plays beautifully in the whole piece. So the result is, as you describe, this polytextural macaronic motet. Um, I, I actually was not aware that these existed in the Renaissance, but you, you say that they do. So th th this is in some ways, even though extremely unique and creative and new, it looks backward on old forms and ideas. Right, so I have a big interest in sacred music and there, these motets, I believe that they came about because they wanted to hide, they were writing essentially sacred music and they wanted to, to embed sort of hidden meanings in these, in the sacred dis discourse. So they would take like a, like a secular text from from the vernacular and layer it on top of the Latin text, for example. Um, but it has the same, the same sort of um, very, um, this fabric with things sort of popping at different rhythms and things, um, text, unusual textural 
metabolisms because of the layering of the languages. And of course, a lot of the rhythms in vessel come about through the, the rhythms of the, the original languages. Huh. Huh. Um, there's also this beautiful way in that we're hearing three poems sung at the same time. Uh, they progress separately and individually. And each, each poem, if the listener were to listen either um, comprehensively to all at the same time or to focus on one, you feel that each poem, each singer has their own universe per se, their own um, melodic and rhythmic DNA. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you achieve that? Is that uh, even in, from the level of your craft, how you control those devices? Yeah, so that's a great, um, a great question about craft. And polytextual vocal music is an interest of mine. So this piece has a precedent in By the Streams of Babylon, my psalm setting for two soprani. And then it was expanded upon in the Debertson Passion, which is for 12 singers. So this piece sits in the middle of those. But what I do is, um, you're right that I inhabit each language and I create a sound world for each language. And a lot of that has to do with the spoken rhythms, right? So the English in the middle is very, is, tends, to have, tends to have longer rhythmic values and is very clear. It's like a, like a crux running through the whole, the whole texture. And it tends to be more, recitative like maybe whereas the hebrew layered over top is much more melismatic and has these these florid um florid melismas um because if you look at the hebrew um the hebrew itself is much shorter it's it's longer in translation but the but the actual the actual syllables it's got it's got fewer syllables right so i have to stretch those out and then the Latin is only in fragments. So you get these, you get it coming in and out and it's got, again, it's very melismatic, but it's in a different rhythmic metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, and the way, and it's also, there's also a, in terms of craft, a functional thing that, that goes on in the piece where the singers are treated more instrumentally as the piece goes on. So there's a pulse in the piece and it starts out just in the instruments, but then as the piece progresses, the singers start to get the pulse, which is sometimes quite disjunct. I mean, there are leaps of a, of a ninth, um, and, and the instruments start to get the melodic lines more in both solos and in tutti. So, it, so the voices became, become truly instrumental. They're playing a, an instrumental role. Um, and that's, that's another thing that's, that's common in my music. And then the, and the instruments are, are engaging in this dimensionality where they're they're echoing the the, the melodic lines that the that the voices have sung in developing those. Right, uh, that's that's uh, of course that's true, and it it rings so true to me as I think about the piece because um, you get to a point where the uh, the stanzas conclude at a certain point and there's an instrumental interlude where they're sort of stealing or overtaking some of the melodic ideas of each singer. And when the three singers return into the texture, the, the piece reaches a climax of sorts. And it is actually this important dramatic point uh, in each of the three poems. But at that moment, you're right, the singers start to uh, sing in unison, in rhythmic unison. And they, against the anvil, the, one of the percussionists now begins to play the, the anvil. And so there's this rhythmic, and, and it's, it's very primitive or, or, or uh, marked and strong, mm -hmm. this dialogue between the three singers singing in rhythmic unison against the anvil. And they do feel more like instruments than like voices at that, at that point. Right, and they, they really form a composite texture where they become like a meta voice because they're doing this, this wild tremolo and, right. and you, get, you have six different notes in the tremolo. So, but at, that's the point where the Hebrew text is singing the song of, song, song of Songs quote, my beloved is mine and I am his. So that's the culmination of that text. And then the English text is singing 
this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart, which is its culmination. And the, the Latin text is talking about the boat bringing the man back to where the woman dwells. So To the um, lake. Right, yeah. So, so I think how, how I'm able to, um, to achieve that sort of build is, is through having these resets where things get really transparent along the way. So there are a few spots before that where where we reach a place of greater density and then everything thins out like one of the spots is where the the cummings poem says i fear no fate and there's literally nothing going on behind the voice it's just her singing saying that i fear no fate for you are my fate and then the other the other instruments start to come layer again but it layer it builds up and then it thins out and resets to a place where it starts again fresh. And it does this again before the middle section when it says, when the Hebrew poem says, my beloved come into me, and then it builds again. And so each time it builds, it builds further. So that build is sort of the, the ultimate build to the place that you're talking about. And then it thins out again for the, for the recap of the English poem. Of the English poem. So the English poem is the only poem of the three that sort of restates the first line from the first stanza. So you use that sort of as a little coda. Right, yeah, so that functions like a little coda. So the, the line, I carry your heart, I carried in my heart, comes back in the Cummings poem. And so that's an opportunity to thin things out again and just, just focus on that, um, on the, the middle singer singing that. But when you, when you get to that moment, that's when you bring in these prayer bowls that are played by the right. percussionist that the, the viewer will see on the far right of the screen. The percussionist that, that has been playing the anvil and the chimes now walks out and stands be, uh, closer to the three singers and plays these beautiful prayer bowls. It's great. The prayer bowls are interesting because they sound different in every performance because even though, as you know, in the score, they're notated they call for specific pitches. Those pitches are so indeterminate. I mean, some of them have like, it sounds like a second when you hit them. So every time the pieces play, there's a different collection of prayer bowls in a different sound happening. But isn't that a lovely thing in and of itself that each time it's different? Yes. Yes. Huh. And it was particularly, um, Oberlin had particularly nice um, prayer bowls. So thank you for that. Of course. We have a lovely collection of instruments. Um, trying to think of other things I can ask you that might give uh, insight into your piece before you hear it. Well, the, I think it's important for people to understand that there's an ostinato, it's an ostinato driven piece. So there's a heartbeat that runs all the way through the piece and that starts in the piano, you hear it right away. It's right. like a pulse, right? But it's not a, it's not a regular, super regular pulse. It varies a little bit, but so the heartbeat comes from this line, and that's the, that's the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. Um, it, it, ha, um, it comes from the Cummings poem in a way, the idea of this ostinato, but that's a heartbeat that, that continues all the way through the piece. Huh. And this heartbeat, uh, I notice it, of course, in the piano and the harp, but you also notice it in the vibraphone and sometimes in the glockenspiel. Can you... Talk about the, 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 this pulse and this texture, this rhythmic texture is so uh, sparkly and glistening. Yeah, that the, the sound world was something I was really, I really had a lot of fun making this beautiful sparkly sound world. Um, and a lot, of this, a lot of the textures are in the high register. So when you do get those low bass notes, like the low C and the, the low sustained low, low C and the double bass, it's like really, really yeah. cool because it opens up the sonic space. Right. But see, the, the, the voices get the pulse too. So you, you have, so you could see that, that ninth leap. Yes. So, they, they, so they start getting the pulse in the middle. And then they, they, they engage too with that. With At that. that moment when the harp and the piano are playing these very florid yeah. lines. Right, right. So the, the, there's a role reversal. There's a role reversal, I would say. Yeah. So it's like exploring like all sides of the, the material, I think. What's interesting is that when you read a poem, 
it can mean something different for every reader. And, it, uh, and perhaps that's what makes poems so rich is that they can be interpreted from so many different angles. But yet, when you listen to your piece, you're helping the listener actually imagine all kinds of other metaphors by, by the way they mix with the other poems, but also by their, the way they're set melodically and this glistening kaleidoscopic percussion sound world that, that accompanies them. Yeah, and I love the idea that, I mean, I have a specific interpretation for this piece in mind, or I had it when I wrote it, but I love this idea of people getting other metaphors out of it and, and hearing other, other resonances through the way that the texts interact. Hmm. Well, it was such a pleasure working on it. Your music gives so much back to the musicians, to the performers. It was a joy all the way through the rehearsal process. Uh, I know that you're currently busy at work on a horn concerto. Yeah, horn. yeah. And uh, I anxiously await your new works uh, with, with great enthusiasm. Thank you so much. And it was just a delight to be at Oberlin and work with you and the ensemble. And it was just so much fun, wonderful performance. And I, I hope everyone enjoys it. And now I hope our virtual audience enjoys the performance of Vessel by Kathy Agosh. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. 